He jumped into a couple verses last week as we were closing, but uh, we're going to have to look at them again because it's been a week, you know. And I don't know about you, but if I read something a week later, I can't remember it. But so we're going to we're going to help you. But let me let me just ask you a question. What is the perfect idea of rest for you? When you think of rest, what is your go-to picture of what you would envision it being for you? Where would you be? What would you be doing? In the woods and a tree. That is rest for Greg Buck. Okay. Somebody else. At the beach. For how long? Before you really rest. How how many days before you unwind? You know the reason I ask. When Rob and I was first married, and we took a vacation, the old mechanic I was working with told me, "You need two weeks vacation." He said, the first, if you go for one week, he said, you never really unwind. He said, it takes you three or four days to forget about work, and then you, by Wednesday, you're already thinking about having to go back. He said, if you, if you take a two-week vacation that first week, you're still unpacking all that in your heart and your mind. That second week, you are free. <laughs> so how long would you have to be at the beach? A week would be good for me. Two weeks, I wouldn't want <laughs> Somebody else. What is rest? A cruise. A cruise. What kind? Caribbean? Ocean cruise. Ocean cruise? Ocean cruise. Yeah. Disney? Down through? No, I don't want to go to Disney. <laughs> just down through the Caribbean and stop on the island. And, but mainly just sit on the back of the boat and watch the sunsets, watch the sunrises. You would rest. I would rest. You would rest. Somebody else. What's rest look like for you? How do you rest? That's upholstery work. <laughs> yes. That's a short rest. What is what would be a good rest for Brian? I would say a cruise. Also. A cruise. Yeah, because when you go, you don't have to worry about anything. Everything's took care of. Your meals, everything. Kim. A second. <laughs> With him. Well, just, she, she don't know about that. Because <laughs> if he goes without you, you're worried. <laughs> That's not rest. <laughs> Karen, what is what would the picture perfect rest be for you? I think a cruise too. A cruise. Yeah. Man. Eva? No, the cruise. <laughs> Sounds like we need a church yes. cruise. Yeah. Right. Just being home. Nice. At feet, home. With my feet up. With your feet up. In your cat. Do you have a certain chair? Yeah. Certain chair. Well, I sit by the computer chair, in the computer chair, but that's where I read the Bible and do everything that I have to do. Do you have a blanket? Yeah. And a blanket. <laughs> do you have a cup of coffee there? Well, sometimes. Sometimes. I don't drink a lot of coffee. At home, in that chair, with your feet up. <laughs> Karen. Sitting by the fireplace reading a good book. Okay. All right. And nowhere to go. Right. Nowhere you have to be. Right. Beth, what does rest look like to you? Perfect rest. A month at the house without grandchildren and big children. <laughs> him at work, and I have the house to myself all day long for a month. I mean, he'll come home and I'll, 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 say, I'll cook dinner, and I don't mind cooking dinner when it's just him and I, and I don't have to fight to get to the kitchen. And you have rest. And I have rest. Because then it's up to me what I do. Tamer. Well, I'm not really if to walk the roof up, I go down to the shop. <laughs> He's got a nice little shop. 
And he's got a nice heater in there, too. What about you? I have, I'm like Eva. I have a chair that reclines. And uh, I have a cat, Snarls, that he gets up beside me and works his magic and puts me to sleep. I mean, he, he gets it. I mean, it just happens. For me, and, and nowhere to go, and the phone doesn't ring with somebody trying to sell me insurance, and they can't even speak English hardly. Robin, what is rest? What is picture of rest for you? I would say a ride through the countryside. That's what she enjoys most. You just go for a ride. Nowhere, nowhere you have to be. Just a leisurely ride. Just. Marion, what does, if you if you was to put your finger on rest, what? What would be your favorite back in the day or even now? Right now, Toby and Wanda, their daughter, gave me her relaxing chair. I can push a button and I <laughs> can just go back, or I can push a button and it'll lift me up. I could just walk right. But I don't Those know. Those are I nice. Can. But a cup of coffee and relax in my chair. And that chair. Do you have a blanket with you? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Carol gave me something new for Christmas. It's a wraparound. It's like a scarf. Oh, my. Wow. It comes all around. It's lined with that soft stuff. Sure, the lining. You can uh -huh. put it around your neck. <laughs> She's going to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, that was really a big help. Kim's going to go back and get a bike here in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> well, our Bible study tonight is on rest. I believe it's verse 9. I, I, I love this verse. The older I get, the more I like it. Verse 9, chapter 4, Hebrews. There remains a rest for the people of God. When you're young and boundless energy, you could care less about that verse. Because you don't need any rest. You just, you're like the energizer bunny. You just keep going and going and going. But after you've had some birthdays, this verse just sounds better all the time. <laughs> we are not machines. And we've realized that. There's, there's, there's a point when you can push yourself and push yourself but the old body just don't work like it used to. And we don't have the gumption we used to. And we, we just, you know, tire out quicker than we used to. And we're, I told one guy I'm putting in more time and I'm getting less done. You know, it just, that's, that, it just happens. I love that verse, there remains a rest for the people of God. Well, Hebrews is, is telling all of us that it's okay to rest. It's okay. It took me a long time to realize that was okay. I was just always full of energy. When I was a kid, if I was growing up today, I've said this before, they'd put me on every drug there is, you know, but I was one of them kids that couldn't sit still because I always, well, that went clear into my 40s, up into my early 50s, where I was just go, go, go constantly. What well, wore off, <laughs> and the warranty is up on all that. But uh, taking a break is necessary because everybody needs a rest. Everybody needs a break. It doesn't matter. Uh, you do the same thing over and over and over. After a while, you need to do something different. Just as a just a break. I don't care if it's sitting at the desk. You got to do something different after a while. And, and give your eyes a rest, um, give your mind a break. I don't care what it is. Everybody needs a break. God never intended for his people to live a hairy, crazy, chaotic existence. Uh, we know that, but yet when you talk to most people, that's, that's how they live. We're known more for the lines in our face than we are the praise in our heart. 
And that goes across the line. It's not just Nazarenes. It's all Christians. We, we're known for you know, everything we've got to get done. And it just wears on us. If it's not the property, it's, it's the house. If it ain't the house, it's the car. If it ain't the car, it's the appliances. If it ain't the appliances, it's the kids. If it ain't the kids, it's the grandkids. I mean, it just, you know, it, it just never stops. And there's more and more expected of us. And there's less and less help. Well, just as we need physical rest, the writer of Hebrews is talking about a spiritual rest that is even more so important. And if we're not paying attention, our soul and spirit can just get so weary and so dry that one day you wake up and say, I'm just running on empty. Physically, you may be all right, but your soul is starved if you neglect it. I love that line in the 23rd Psalms. It says, what does he do for our soul? Restore. He restoreth my soul. Think about that. He restoreth my soul. Now, you get a good night's sleep. You go on a cruise, Kim and Brian, and you come back and you're all rested. That's wonderful. Marion gets to sit in her chair and, and, and enjoy it, and Eva and... and Tamer gets to go down to his shop and while away some hours and get some stuff done. And, you know, we feel better. But there are things that we need to do for our soul. We can't neglect that. We need to be doing things where God feeds us and energizes us and equips us and blesses us and fills us to keep us going. That's called, He restoreth my soul. That when we come into his presence empty and we let him fill us up, that's important. That's just as important as a good night's sleep. That's just as important as a good meal to make you feel better when you're hungry. God has provided a spiritual rest available to each one of us every day if we will avail ourselves to it. But there's several applications here. Number one, if, you, if you're writing this down, if you've got a, something to write on, I'm going to quickly give you some thoughts here that I've got. And I don't know what you've got out of Hebrews 4, but this is what I've got. Number one, there's rest to your soul when you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. There is rest for your soul when somebody gets saved. Sin is a burden. Sin is a ball and chain. Sin is a heavy weight. It's an anchor. It's a boat anchor people drag around. Their sin wears them out, and they don't even know it. And they're dragging it around, living with it every day, and sin will do that. Sin will absolutely wear people out. It's a heaviness. There's no rest for the wicked. I mean, they just under it. Trying to serve the devil and sin will wear you out. Living unto yourself will wear you out. Ignoring God's call will wear you out. Serving the lusts of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life will wear you out. Trying to be religious without Jesus as your Savior will wear you out. Living for this world as that's all there is will wear you out. One day you wake up and you're just empty. I was reading about a, a man that climbed the corporate ladder and he finally got to the top as CEO and he said it was as empty at the top as he had ever felt in, any, in every, any point of his life. He got to the top, he got everything he thought he wanted and he said it's meaningless. Page 365 in your hymnal. Page 365. We're not going to sing this. We're going to just look at it. I thought of this when I was thinking about what sin does to us and the heaviness. Page 365. You probably have heard this before. I remember when my burdens rolled away. I had carried them for years, night and day. Right, night and day. That's a heavy load. When I sought the blessed Lord and I took him at his word, then at once all my burdens rolled away. 
in the movie or in the book of Pilgrim's Progress, when Pilgrim finally climbs up Mount Calvary and kneels at the cross, and that burden on his back is depicted as this big pack, it just rolls down that hill and it just rolls away, and he is set free, depicting sin going. That's what this song's all about. I remember when my burdens rolled away that I cared, that I feared would never leave night or day. Jesus showed to me the loss, so I left them at the cross. I was glad when my burdens rolled away. I remember when my burdens rolled away that had hindered me for years, night and day, as I sought the throne of grace, just a glimpse of Jesus' face, and I knew that my burdens could not stay. I am singing since my burdens rolled away. There's a song within my heart. Night and day I am living for my king. And with joy I shout and sing. Hallelujah, all my burdens rolled away. I've never forgot how I felt when I got saved. I never forgot how I felt when I got sanctified. The joy of the Lord and the power. And I felt like I was walking off the ground about that high. I was just set free from sin. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You're set free. There, there is rest that comes to your soul. You just feel light like this big weight just taken off of you. So I just wrote down number one. There is rest to the soul when we give our heart to Jesus and we live for him. Chapter 4, verse 2, not everybody that hears the gospel preached benefits from it. Not everybody gets blessed. Not everybody, sadly, even hears it. Jesus talked about that in the parable of the sower. Remember that? There was uh, different types of soil. There's the, the hard ground. There's the stony ground. There's the thorny ground. And then there's the good soil. That's all pictures of the human heart, isn't it? Jesus later told the disciples when they said, what on earth are you talking about? Would you explain that? And he said, seeds the word of God. But he's talking about the heart. Some people's hearts are so hard they can hear the word preached and it just doesn't penetrate them. They've just they've got hardened in life and they can hear it and you can witness to them and you can invite them to church and they just say, oh, I've heard that. And some people, you know, they hear it, and uh, the old devil, you know, he, Jesus said the birds come along and eat the seed. The old devil steals it away before uh, it has a chance to take root, and you invite them to church, and they think, well, I might, and they get down the road a little bit, and they just forget it. And then Jesus talked about the, the briars and the thorns, and, and, and he referred to them as the cares of this world. Next thing you know, we're so caught up and worried about stuff and worried about stuff that, that the Word of God really doesn't have a chance. That's why we're not supposed to worry. It chokes the Word. And then there's the good ground that brings forth 40, 60, 100 fold. Verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not benefit or profit them because they didn't mix it with what? Faith. Faith in Jesus. Faith in what God can do. You gotta you get a hold of that word. You hear the word, but you gotta you gotta hear it with faith. You gotta say, I believe that. That's got my name on it. And claim that verse, claim that word, claim that promise. You, you gotta believe. He's gonna refer us back to people in the Old Testament that heard the word. And they didn't get anything out of it because they didn't hear it with faith. There's somewhere along the way, when you read your Bible, and I read my Bible, we have to read with believing because Hebrews will say, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you gotta, you got to believe it with faith. Hold your place here and go to Psalms 95 because, well, the writer of Hebrews went there, so we're going to go there. 
He, Psalms 95, if you got one hand in Hebrews and you got one hand in Psalms, the writer of Hebrews is talking about people in the Old Testament that we talked about Sunday that went through the wilderness and when Moses led them up there, they sent a delegation of people in there to look out and spy out and bring back a report and 10 of them come back and said, it's a great land, productive and fertile and wonderful. We could never do it though. There's giants there. It's, it, it's a land that if we had it, we'd, we'd all we'd do is fight to keep it. Let's go back to Egypt. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb was the only two that said, don't listen. Them people that near the wells, Debbie Downers, as Brian would say, we can do it with God's help. Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth and strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker of love. He is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture, the sheep of his hand, people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my work 40 years long, was I grieved with this generation and said it's a people that do err where? Where are they making a mistake? In their heart. I always say it. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. This is where I went wrong. I went wrong in their heart. And they have not known my ways unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into what? My rest. That's what we're talking about tonight in Hebrews. Hebrews 4. Let us therefore fear, verse 1, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, and that they heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he has said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the earth. He takes us back to those people uh, well, if you go back into chapter 3, verse 10, well, verse 9, well, verse 8. <laughs> Gee, I keep backing up. Verse 8, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Does that sound like Psalms 95? Yeah, that's, that's what he's quoting. I was grieved for that generation and said, They do always err in their hearts. They have not known my ways, so I swear my wrath. They shall not enter into my rest. Verse 19, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They didn't get to go into the promised land. Their kids did. The, if you remember, their complaint was, We're going to die out here and our kids will die. God took that personal and said, okay, that's right, you will, but your kids will live. The kids got to go in. They didn't. God turned it around on them for 40 years. He preached on that Sunday. I mean, it's just all kinds of funerals forever. They, that whole generation died off. Verse 1, chapter 4 that's what last Sunday or last Wednesday night we talked about. If you're going to be afraid of anything, be afraid of missing out what God's doing. Don't be afraid of the world. Don't be afraid of what's happening. Don't be afraid of the news. Be afraid of missing what God has for you. And that should be what propels us into following as close as we can get. Some people are exposed to the Word of God, but it don't, they don't benefit from it because they don't listen with faith. Hearing and believing will give you rest. Hearing the Word of God, believing the Word of God, and you'll have rest for your souls. 
Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and thou shalt be saved. And you'll get a rest. Failure to believe, and you'll wander for years in life in a wilderness. Number two, there's a rest that comes from following the will of God. I can tell you that when God is calling you to do something, and it's God doing it, you won't have rest till you do it. I've told a lot of people, one counseling about the will of God. I said, well, if you cannot do it and it doesn't bother you, then it's probably not the will of God. It's probably just a passing thing. But if you can't shake it and you can't get away from it and it keeps you up and it just eats you alive, that's the will of God. Because if it's what God wants you to do, you can't get away from it. You can run, but you can't hide. Now, you can grieve the Holy Spirit eventually to where it don't bother you anymore. But initially, if it's God's will, it'll, it'll just keep coming back and it'll keep coming back and keep coming back. Verse 11, chapter 4, let us labor. This sounds like an oxymoron. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. How does that say that in the NIV? Let us make every effort to enter into that rest. Let us work as hard as we can so we can have some rest. He's not talking about salvation or earning your salvation with Christ. He's talking about you and I being faithful to abide in that rest in God. There is rest. There is peace. That When you've done what you know that God called you to do and you do it, and you walk away and you've got peace in your heart, you did what you were told to do. You can, you can go home and you'll have peace and you'll have rest. You were faithful. I have never, uh, when I follow what God has prod, prodded me to do and I was faithful to it, I've never walked away saying, gee, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I've always been blessed because I was faithful. But when I, it bothers me is when, is when I'm not faithful. Let us labor. Just because the Israelites finally got into the promised land and took possession of the land and distributed the land and, and the tribes got their possession and they built houses and dwelt there doesn't mean that the work was over and that they, from that point on, lived a carefree life. No. There's orchards to keep up. There's homes to keep up. There's barns to fix. There's cattle and sheep to look after. They're, they had to manage it all. It was not a carefree life. Joshua says that God gave them rest. But that didn't mean they weren't doing something. And so it is spiritually, when we get saved, it doesn't mean that it's the work's over. We, we are still involved, aren't we, spiritually, actively pursuing God and and seeking Him and continue, continuing to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we continue to be disciples and, and the Lord continues to work on us and grow us and mature us and, and uh, use us. We don't just get saved and sit in the pew and say, well, I don't ask me to do nothing. <laughs> no, we, we continue to serve the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 4, makes reference to the creation. For he spake in a certain place, and on the seventh day of, on this wise, that God did rest the seventh day from all his work. Now you know the creation story. If you're reading through the Bible, you just, this is fresh in your mind from, you started in Genesis, and, and you read all about that. That's fresh. On the sixth day, when God finished, on the seventh day he rested, did that mean that God never did anything again? Is he still at work? Yes. What's he doing? Working on us. <laughs> he's got you and me, brother and sister, in his hands. He, 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 he's got this whole world in his hands. He is still at work. Doesn't mean that when this, after six days that God ceased all activity and never did anything again said, I'm on vacation, leave me alone. No. God is still active in his creation. He's still present in this world. 
Some people believe that that's what he did. He created it and walked away. No, he didn't. Actively involved, he sent his son. He, he, he sent the Holy Spirit. He, he is engaged in his creation and with all of us. He didn't stop. So in the same way with us, when we come to Christ, just because we're saved or just because we're sanctified doesn't mean that, the, that we, we don't do anything anymore. No, we continue to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 20, God took this whole plan and incorporated it into the Ten Commandments, didn't he? The six days he created the earth, and then on the seventh day, what did he do? Rest. He rested. And then, what? It, if you know what the next verse is, and he sanctified that day. And uh, he said to all his followers, we follow the same pattern. Six days on, one day off. Six days on, one day off. And we, and we follow that the best we can. Some weeks it may look like a mess, but <laughs> we try to follow that. Six days on, one day off. I heard years ago something, and I've never been able to track it down, but they said over in France, I think it was in, it's either 1700s or early 1800s, they, they, they tried every configuration of work to maximize uh, how much they could get out of people. Really, the government did studies and they worked people 30 days straight without a day off. They worked people three weeks. They, they, they worked, they went, some they went a couple months and never gave a day off. And when it was all done, and I wish I had the facts right here in front of you, but I'll never forget, I heard it. And this is not religious, this is just the government. And they said, that in this study that they did, that the greatest amount of productivity and the greatest amount of contentment with the workers, where they weren't all fighting and mad, and they were getting the most done, is when they worked six days and they had one day off. <laughs> and they worked six days and they had one day off. They said that was, of all this study and of all the scenarios that they did, uh, that, that's what they come up with. And I thought, you know, you could have read your Bible and got that. <laughs> you just read your Bible. It's a whole lot simpler. God said six days, one day off. Isn't that incredible? Fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it home. For the six days the Lord created the earth, Sanctified the seven. So we understand, we understand our need for physical rest, but we also also understand well the need for spiritual rest. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter ten. We we talked about this last week a little bit. We're going to look at it again because it's been a week. How do we feed our soul? How do we find nourishment? How do we let God restore us? How do we how do we get our batteries charged? How do we, how do we how do we come away better to face a new week? Chapter ten, verse twenty-two. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil, evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That is confession and repentance and coming clean with God. That is each one of us saying, God, do whatever you want to do in my heart. Is there, search me, O oh God, and know my way. See if there be any unclean thing in me. That's, that's what that verse is talking about. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And let's consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And we come together and we edify one another. And we encourage. Now there's a word in there in the King James called provoke. Now don't go around provoking people in the wrong way. Some people do that. Now, no. Provoke to love and to good works. That is to stir them up and encourage them and, 
And when you and I come together in church, we that's what we're doing. We're building each other up. And somebody over here testifies. And somebody over here just says something. And, and, and somebody back there needed to hear that. And somebody up here is blessed by that. And somebody gets up and sings a song that just blesses all of us. And the music that is played in the, in the prelude just calms our heart and we and we forget about the night before and maybe Monday morning's work and, and, and it just draws us into the presence and it helps us worship. Verse 25, And not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. That is the day of the Lord. The Lord coming back. As we get closer to the edge and closer to the last days, how much more that is so important. That's how we feed our soul. That's how we let God restore us. So after a horrible week, when everything went wrong that could go wrong, and you come into church and you're just, the old devil's telling you, what's the point of coming? What? what? He ain't going to say nothing to you today that he's even going to touch what's going on. Well, maybe he doesn't. But just simply being around other Christians and singing the songs is up and taking time to pray in the sanctuary and stilling your hearts and separating yourselves from that and you come here, there's something happens in our heart and we're restored and our souls get rest. That is so important. You, We can sit in that chair or we can go on that cruise. <laughs> We can go out to the shop and work. <laughs> we can go up that tree stand. <laughs> and that's important that, uh, that we do that from time to time. But your soul gets so starved. That's why we need to come in here and let our soul be restored. Let me read you a story. This is out of the Communicator's Commentary on Hebrews by Lewis Evans, Jr. I thought this was timely. The first time I flew in a rain-drenched overcast sky with my flight instructor, and the rain began to pelt the windscreen like an angry drummer, I was far from the state of rest. Now, we just came through a storm. This, this, you just picture this. You, you, you lived through this just a day and a half ago. Whistle of clouds shrouded the wingtips. A pervasive anxiety clutched at my breathing. My legs became taut. My hands gripped the controls with a sweaty fear. I jerked and overcompensated in reaction to the instruments and the plane zigzagged through the sky like a drunken pilot was in control. As fatigue began to build up and the tension rapidly went from bad to worse, perspiration cascaded down my face and my armpits and I was drenched while my flight instructor sat there absolutely unperturbed. When I turned my head to look at him, he met my eyes with a twinkle in his and he firmly took my right hand off the controls and put my lower fingers on my kneecap, a position of ease that he taught me in the first lesson. I remembered. My thumb and index finger was enough to control that plane. Relax, he said softly. Louis, you're only in a normal, warm front. You're flying a stable aircraft with the strongest wings in a single engine model that was ever made. Trust them. Sit back, turn your head, eyes a bit now. Nice, slow, smooth corrections. Keep your sweep of the instruments going in a normal, normal pattern. Rest. Enjoy this storm. I tried to concentrate on the relaxation and slow corrections to the minor variations of the altitude. I was amazed first at how relaxed he was and the improvement in mind. True, true, it was years before I got over the tummy tightening and the sweaty palms 
and the nervousness when I entered a cloud bank, but the day came when I could still fly in the clouds and I could fly in the rain with it pelting the windshield and I could continue to fly and have peace. Peace and rest in the midst of life's continuation are indicators that the people of God are maturing. That is part of what rest means, to be at his place at his time doing the thing he planned for us to do, confident in his strength and resources in the design of the system. Some people go through life like that guy trying to fly that plane, and it's just, they're a nervous wreck. Some people can go through the very same experience and just face it with a smile. It just makes us so mad. The longer you and I walk with God and the more that we learn to trust Him and the more experiences that you and I have been through, we build up this bank of experiences back here where we say to ourselves, if God got us through all that, He can get us through this. And one day you get the phone call and it's all going south and you have peace. Because you know that your God can help you. I was helping my cousin Bill Fence Monday. I told him, I said, that's probably the best day for us to do it. Big, long stretch of fence, long road. He had went down to the basement to get some stuff. I'm standing out there, and I watched something I've seen before, but it's been a long time, and I had forgotten. It was a whole flock of buzzards. And I don't know what you call a flock of buzzards. I don't know. They, there's probably a name for them. Uh, crows are called a murder, but I don't know what buzzards are. A bunch, bunch of them. I counted, I think, 18. And they were real low, and they were just circling, and I thought, I better start moving. <laughs> they were just, and they were close. So like from here to the fellowship hall, and I mean, they were close. And I just stood there, and I'm waiting on him. He, he had to go find some stuff in the basement. I'm standing there, and I'm watching them, and they just start going in a circle. If you've seen this, you know what I'm talking about. They just kept going in a circle. And that circle kind of spread out. And they're not one on top of each other, but they're close enough because there's so many of them. And then a few more started coming in, and they went up, and they went up, and they kept getting higher and higher and higher. I mean, they were way up there. And this took a little bit of time. And I thought, well, there's something dead there. But no, they're, they're, they're leaving. And then when they were way up there and they're still going in a circle, one of them peeled off and started going across the field out there towards the ridge and out of sight, and then another one, and then another one, in, in a straight line, but there's pretty good distance between each one of them, and they were following the leader until every one of them and what I had forgot, but God showed me, they were not flapping their wings. They were gliding in the air. They got up high enough. They got into the wind, wind current, and it was just almost effortless. They just, they were flying, and they weren't even, there, there, there was no effort. They were just soaring. And they all, every one of them, not one time did they ever flap their wings. They just, they made that look so easy. <laughs> You know, and I watched him till the last one cleared the ridge, and I couldn't see it no more. It was gone. There is a rest for the people of God that God can give us through the power of the Holy Spirit, the ability to soar with Him. And it gets a whole lot easier when we're doing it His way and in His time. 
and we're faithful to it. God gives us grace for this world. Whether we're a buzzard <laughs> or whatever we are, God gives us the ability to sail through stuff. He didn't say that we would never have to, but if we go through it, He gives us grace. There is rest with God for whatever we go through. Amen. Verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. What would happen if one of them buzzards said, it won't work. <laughs> I don't believe, I'm going back down to the ground. I'm going to walk around for a while. No, none of them did it. They all stayed true to the course and followed. God help every one of us. And you're not following me. We're following Christ. And we all get in line. Jesus said, come after me. Follow me. Take up your cross. Follow me. We can do that. We can, we can take up the wings of eagles. The scripture said there's a time to run. You wait on the Lord and you can run and not be weary. There'll be a time to walk and we can walk and not faint. And there'll be a time when God says just wait. If we're resting in Him, we can run and we won't be weary. We won't burn out because we're doing it God's way and with His power. And there'll be times that we can walk in His strength and we can keep walking in spite of everything because we're doing it in His strength. And there'll be time that we will stop what we're doing and we will wait on the Lord. And we won't walk and we won't run. We will just wait because that's what the Spirit said to do. And if we do that, we'll have rest because we're doing it God's way, God's timing, Whatever he says. There remains a rest for the people of God. The world's ver version of rest is completely different than ours. Jesus said, You want rest? Matthew 11. He said, you want rest? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you something to do. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a yoke. And a burden. But my yoke is easy. And my burden is light, and I will give you rest. Serving Him and doing it God's way brings rest to our soul. And for our spirit as well. I will give you rest. I love it. There remains a rest for the people of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. The promise of God that we can have rest to our soul. Father, we, we apologize and we repent. There's times we just stay so worked up about stuff. So worried and so stressed out that, Father, we, we fail to come into your presence like the psalmist said and kneel before you and worship you. Father, forgive us when the cares of this world crowd you out. Help us, Lord, to follow so close to the Spirit that, yes, indeed, we have rest to our spirit and rest to our souls. Father, give us the strength in our spirit to do what we need to do, the grace to do it, and the faith to believe that your word is true and amen in all things. Lord, as we face the rest of this week, may we go with grace. May we go with God. May we go with your anointing. May we go with your blessings. And may we do it with the joy of the Lord all over us. 
In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Anything you'd like to add? It's called a wake. A wake of buzzers. There's a couple different names that they give them. It's a wake if they're gathered eating on. It's called a committee if they just kind of sit on power lines together. No, well, that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> and then. Have you ever seen them after a rain where they get out and they hold a 